हेलो क्लास वेलकम टू कनेक्टेड इन टूडेज क्लास वी विल बी रीडिंग द स्टोरी टाइटल टू स्टोरीज अबाउट फ्लाइंग दिस चैप्टर कंसिस्ट ऑफ टू स्टोरीज और पोर्ट्स नेमली हिज फर्स्ट फ्लाइट रिटन बाय लियामो फ्लैरिटी एंड ब्लैक एरोप्लेन रिटन बाय फेडरिक फोरसाइट By the end of this chapter you will have a better understanding of storytelling and learn new words. You may also gain better knowledge of the English language. Now students, read out the chapter loudly with me. I shall assist you if you get stuck anywhere. We now begin with the first story out of the two. The young seagull was alone on his ledge. His two brothers and his sister had already flown away the day before. He had been afraid to fly with them. Somehow, when he had taken a little run forward to the brink of the ledge and attempted to flap his wings, he became afraid. The greater expanse of the sea stretched down beneath, and it was such a long way down, miles down. He felt certain that his wings would never support him. So he bent his head and ran away back to the little hole under the ledge where he slept at night. Even when each of his brothers and his little sister, whose wings were far shorter than his own, ran to the brink, flapped their wings and flew away. He failed to muster up courage to take that plunge which appeared to him so desperate. His father and mother had come around calling to him shrilly, upbraiding him, threatening to let him starve on his ledge unless he flew away. But for the life of him, he could not move. Good. The story is about a young seagull who is at that stage of life where he has to learn to fly. Unlike his younger brothers and sister, he is too afraid to fly. When all of them went flying for the first time near the edge of the sea, all of them except him succeeded he could not trust his wings he got terrified by the vast sea and got convinced that he could never fly as a result he was ashamed and disheartened and thus went inside the ledge where usually he slept his younger siblings managed to take their first flight despite their wings being shorter than his but he could not summon the courage though he tried so desperately He was scolded by his parents for not trying again but he was so afraid that he could not even move Moving on that was 24 hours ago since then nobody had come near him the day before all day long he had watched his parents flying about with his brothers and sister perfecting them in the art of flight teaching them how to skim the waves and how to dive for fish He had in fact seen his older brother catch his first herring and devour it standing on a rock while his parents circled around raising a proud cackle and all the morning the whole family had walked about on the big plateau midway down the opposite cliff taunting him with his cowardice the sun was now ascending the sky blazing on his ledge that faced the south he felt the heat because he had not eaten since the previous nightfall He stepped slowly out of the brink of the ledge and standing on one leg with the other leg hidden under his wing he closed one eye then the other and pretended to be falling asleep still they took no notice of him he saw his two brothers and his sister lying on the plateau dozing with their heads sunk in their necks his fathers were preening the feather on his white back only his mother was looking at him She was standing on a little high hump on the plateau her white breast thrust forward now and again she tore at a piece of fish that lay at her feet and then scraped each side of her beak on the rock the sight of the food maddened him how he loved to tear food that way scraping his beak now and again to wet it Very well. Now he had been alone for a day after he tried because his parents were busy focusing on his siblings. They helped his sibling master the art of flying and diving for food. His older sibling even caught his first fish when he proudly ate at a rock while his parents celebrated it. That morning his parents taunted him for being a coward. 
The sun had now risen and he was feeling the heat more than ever because he was empty stomach since the night before. He stepped out of his ledge and pretended to sleep on one leg to gain the attention of his family. Still no one noticed him. His siblings were sleeping. His father was cleaning his feathers with his beak and his mother was standing on another plateau eating fish while she noticed him. The seagull got mad about seeing the fish because he was very hungry. He loved to tear away fish and scrap his beak now and then. Ga ga ga. He cried begging her to bring him some food. Ga kol a. She screamed back derisively, but he kept calling plaintively and after a minute or so, he uttered a joyful scream. His mother had picked up a piece of the fish and was flying across to him with it. He leaned out eagerly tapping the rocks with his feet, trying to get nearer to her as she flew across. But when she was just opposite to him, she halted. her wings motionless the piece of the fish in her beak almost within reach of his beak he waited a moment in surprise wondering why she did not come nearer and then maddened by hunger he devoured the fish with a loud scream he fell outward and downward into space then a monstrous terror seized him and his heart stood still he could hear nothing but it only lasted a minute The next moment he felt his wings spread outwards the wind rushed against his breast feathers then under his stomach and against his wings he could feel the tips of his wings cutting through the air he was not feeling headlong now he was soaring gradually downwards and upwards he was no longer afraid he just felt a bit dizzy then he flapped his wing once and he soared upwards ga 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 Go, go, cool up. His mother swooped past him, her wings making a loud noise. He answered her with another scream. Then his father flew over him screaming. He saw his two brothers and his sisters flying around him, curveting and banking and soaring and diving. Good. He cried in hunger to his mom while his mother screamed back angrily but he kept crying which soon turned into a joyful scream at the sight of his mother flying towards him with the piece of fish he got excited as she came near and thus leaned forward suddenly she stopped not too far from him out of excitement and hunger he devoured at the fish without realizing for a moment that he was afraid to fly He got so excited that he fell as soon as he tried. For a moment he was in a shock and stood still out of terror. As this lasted only for a moment and soon his feathers opened as he flew. He could feel the wing against his breast feather, stomach and his wings. He could feel himself cutting through the air. He was not afraid anymore. He was just a bit nervous, but then his mother accompanied him. The whole family screamed out of excitement, thus celebrating his victory over fear. Let's proceed to the next part. Then he completely forgot that he had not always been able to fly and commended himself to dive and soar and curve, shrieking shrilly. He was near the sea now, flying straight over it, facing straight out over the ocean. He saw a vast green sea beneath him, with the little ridges moving over it, and he turned his beaks and sideways and cawed amusedly. His parents and his brother and sister had landed on this green flooring ahead of him. They were beckoning to him, calling shrilly. He dropped his leg to stand on the green sea. His leg sank into it. He screamed with fright and attempted to rise again flapping his wing but he was tired and weak with hunger and he could not rise exhausted by this strange exercise his feet sank into the green sea and then his belly touched it and he sank no farther he was floating on it and around him his family was screaming praising him and their beaks were offering him scraps of dogfish he had made his first flight good Once he overcame his fear he forgot that he was once afraid of it he did all those things he once feared he flew straight over the sea and could see the greenery and the mountains beneath him he screamed out of joy as he enjoyed the victory 
when he landed his family landed along with him as a gesture they were very proud of they were screaming and shouting in the excitement in their high pitched voice he then went into the sea where at first he got scared and thus panicked he tried escaping but got tired and weak because of hunger thus when he calmed down he started floating in the sea when he was once afraid of his family was celebrating in excitement and offered him food as praise finally he had overcome his fear and had made his first flight okay class now that we have learned all these new words let's use them in some sentences now i shall show you some sample sentences now later on make your own sentences with these words and show them to your teacher ledge we crept carefully along the narrow ledge upbraiding i quickly unbraided my hair and brushed it out skim it took me an hour to skim the book herring he fished up a big herring preening the parrot sat preening her plumage on long john's shoulder wet the preview was intended to whet your appetite derisively the others laughed derisively dizzy he was dizzy with the scorching sun curvating it took me some time to get right of the curvating dogs now let's read the next story title the black aeroplane in this chapter i shall assist you if you get stuck anywhere we begin reading it from the first part the moon was coming up in the east behind me and the stars were shining in the clear sky above me there wasn't a cloud in the sky i was happy to be alone high up above the sleeping countryside i was flying my old dakota aeroplane over france back to england i was dreaming of my holiday and looking forward to being with my family i looked at my watch 1:30 in the morning i should call paris control soon i thought As I looked down past the nose of the aeroplane I saw the light of a big city in front of me I switched on the radio and said Paris control Dakota DS 088 here can you hear me I am on my way to England over The voice from the radio answered me immediately DS 088 I can hear you you ought to turn 12 degree west now DS 088 over Good It was the night time when the sky was clear and the star could be seen twinkling. The pilot felt peace in being above a country that had fallen asleep while he was flying over friends to England. It was half past 1 in the morning and he was fantasizing about holiday with his family. When the aeroplane was in France, the pilot thought of informing the Paris control personnel about its presence and for instruction. At that time lights from Paris city were blaring at him. He informed the control agency to which they replied with further instruction on the direction. The control room at Paris instructed him to turn 12 degree towards the west. I checked the map and the compass, switched over to my second and last fuel tank and turned the Dakota 12 degree west towards England. I'll be in time for breakfast, I thought. A good big English breakfast. Everything was going well. It was an easy flight. Paris was about 150 kilometers behind me when I saw the clouds. Storm clouds. They were huge. They looked like a black mountain standing in front of me across the sky. I knew I could not fly up and over them and I did not have enough fuel to fly around them to the north or south. I ought to go back to Paris, I thought, but I wanted to get home. I wanted that breakfast. I'll take the risk I thought and flew that old Dakota straight into the storm inside the clouds everything was suddenly black it was impossible to see anything outside the aeroplane the old aeroplane jumped and twisted in the air I looked at the compass I couldn't believe my eyes the compass was turning round and round and round I was dead it would not work the other instruments were suddenly dead too I tried the radio Good. After receiving the instruction, the pilot greeted up and followed them while putting the last fuel tank into operation. All this time he was dreaming about his time with his family and then he started thinking about having a satisfactory breakfast at the destination point. He was calm and everything was going as planned it. Now the plane had crossed Paris when he started seeing clouds in the sky. 
The presence of cloud made it unsafe to travel by air because there were chances of a storm. They were so huge and dark that Pilate compared them with the black mountains. He knew he couldn't pass them as it was impossible to go above them or escape them with the amount of fuel that was left in the last tank. The right decision would have been to fly back to Paris safely. But the pilot's decision making was clouded by his wish to meet his family. He was so desperately wanted to be with his family and have that English breakfast he had been dreaming of all day that he took the risk of not going back. Thus, he headed the plane right into the storm. It was so dark because of the storm that was nothing visible outside the plane. He started losing control of the plane. The compass and other instruments had also stopped working because of the bad weather. He became helpless. Continue. Paris control, Paris control. Can you hear me? There was no answer. The radio was dead too. I had no radio, no compass and I could not see where I was. I was lost in the storm. Then in the black clouds quite near me, I saw another plane. It had no light on its wings but I could see it flying next to me through the storm. I could see the pilot's face turn towards me. I was very glad to see another person. He lifted one hand and waved, follow me. He was saying, follow me. He knows that I'm lost. I thought he's trying to help me. He turned his aeroplane slowly to the north in front of my Dakota so that it would be easier for me to follow him. I was very happy to go behind the strange aeroplane like an obedient child. After half an hour, the strange black aeroplane was still there in front of me in the clouds. Now there was only enough fuel in the old Dakota's last tank to fly for 5 to 10 minutes more. I was starting to feel frightened again. But then he started to go down and I followed through the storm. Suddenly I came out of the clouds and saw two long straight lines of the lights in front of me. It was a runway, an airport. I was safe. I turned to look for my friend in the black aeroplane but the sky was empty. There was nothing there. The black plane was gone. I could not see it anywhere. Good. He tried calling the Paris control agency who had helped him earlier but couldn't connect because of the weather. In now ever, when everything failed, he saw a ray of hope when he saw another aeroplane. He felt relieved and he saw another pilot's face and willingness to help him escape the storm. He thought to himself that the other pilot is very kind as he knew that they were lost and was trying to help him. The other pilot took his plane ahead of the lost aeroplane to make it easier for them to follow, while the author followed him like an obedient child. He was also panicking because there was very little amount of fuel left. It was only then that he started coming out of the storm and could see the runway to land his plane safely. When he turned to thank the other pilot, he realized that the plane that helped him had disappeared as soon as he came out of the storm. I hope I made myself clear up till now. Moving to the next part. I landed and was not sorry to walk away from the old Dakota near the control tower. I went and asked a woman in the control center where I was and who the other pilot was. I wanted to say thank you. She looked at me very strangely and then laughed. Another aeroplane? Up there in the storm. No other aeroplane was flying tonight. Yours was the only one I could see on the radar. So who helped me to arrive there safely without a compass or a radio or without any more fuel in my tank? Who was the pilot on the strange black aeroplane flying in the storm without lights? Good. The author did not know where he had landed but was not afraid of leaving his plane unattended. He headed straight into the control room to ask about the other pilot. To his utmost surprise, the lady informed him that there was no other plane in the sky except his because of the bad weather. He is left astonished with lots of questions unanswered in his mind. Children. Now that the chapter is finished, let's look at some fun exercises now. You have 4 minutes to try these questions out. First, 
For how long had the seagull been alone? Second, when did the seagull's flight begin? Third, why was the pilot happy? Fourth, how many fuel tanks were there on the plane? How much fuel was left? Excellent answer students. Now let's match your answer with answer sheet. Answer number one. The seagull had been alone for 24 hours. Answer number two. His flight began when he was falling outwards and downward into space. His wings spread outwards. Now he was not falling headlong. He was moving gradually downwards and outwards. Answer number three. The pilot was happy due to two reasons. First, he was alone high up above the sleeping countryside. Second, he was dreaming of his holiday and looking forward to being with his family. Answer number four. There was two fuel tanks in the plane. The pilot had already switched over to the second and the last tank. So there was enough fuel only to fly back to England. Students, now try to answer these personal questions on your own. Remember students, there can be many correct answers. First, do you think the situation of the young seagull arose as sympathy for him? Second, do you think the story, the black airplane is a mystery? Do you see some elements of supernatural power in the story? Okay students, I hope you were able to understand two beautiful flying stories. Now let's move on to an amazing poem titled How to Tell Wild Animals by Carolyn Wells. In this poem, the poet had explained the characteristics of various wild animals in a very funny way. She has used language in a way that generates humor. She is introducing the reader to various kinds of wild animals like Asian lion, Bengal tiger, bear, etc. Explaining each of the animal in a very humorous way. Now read out the chapter loudly with me. I shall assist you if you get stuck anywhere. Let's begin with the first stanza. If ever you should go by chance to the jungle in the east, and if there should to you advance a large and a tiny beast, if he roars at you as you are dying, you will know it is the Asian lion. Good. Let's understand what the poet means with these lines. The poet is telling the reader how they can recognize various animals in the jungle of the east. So in the first stanza, she says that if the reader comes across an animal whose skin is yellowish brown in color, and if it roars at him so strongly that he can die out of fear, it means that he has encountered an Asian lion. She was humorously explained it, the Asian lion which could kill a person with its roar. Or if sometime when roaming round, a noble wild beast greets you with black strips on a yellow ground. Just notice if he eats you, this simple rule may help you learn the Bengal tiger to discern. Good. In the next stanza, she explained an animal that roams in the jungle and belongs to a royal clan. The color of its skin is yellowish with black stripes. She says that if you notice that he kills you and eats you up, then this means that you have surely seen a Bengal tiger. This time also she has used dark humor to explain how a tiger looks because once a person has been eaten up by a wild animal, there is no use in determining which wild animal it is. If strolling forth a beast you view, whose hide with spots is peppered. As soon as he has leapt on you, you'll know it is the leopard. Twill do no good to roar with pain. He'll only leap and leap again. Good. The poet says that if you are casually walking in a jungle, you will meet an animal who has skin with spots on it. This animal is so fast that it will leap on you at once which means that it will jump on you. This jumping is an indication that it is none other than the leopard. Moreover, she adds that if you will cry out in pain, it is not going to be of any use as it will keep on jumping on you. So in this stanza, the poet has explained the characteristics of a leopard. If when you are walking round your yard, you meet a creature there who hugs you very, very hard. Be sure it is a bear. If you have any doubts, I guess, he'll give you just one more caress. Good. 
If you are walking in the lawn area of your house and you meet a creature which hugs you tightly, it is a bear. She further adds that if you are still in doubt regarding the animal, the easiest way is that he will keep hugging and touching you very gently. This act of his will make you sure about his identity. You will come to know that it is a bear. Though to distinguish beast of prey, a novice might nonplus. The crocodile you always may tell from the hyena thus. Hyenas come with merry smiles, but if they weep, they are crocodiles. Good. The poet says that for someone who is new to the job of recognizing animals, it will be like a puzzle to recognize animals that hunt other animals for their food. So here the poet tries to help out the readers by telling the difference between two animals. He says that hyenas will be smiling, whereas if it is a crocodile, it is always in tears. Both of these animals are dangerous. The true chameleon is small, a lizard sort of thing. He hasn't any tears at all and not a single way. If there is nothing on the tree, tis the chameleon you see. Good. The poet says that the next is chameleon which is a small creature. It looks like a lizard. But the difference between the two is that a chameleon does not have ears and wings. Moreover, she says that a chameleon has the ability to change its color according to the surface on which it is sitting. Therefore, if you see a tree and find nothing else on it, then it must be a chameleon sitting on it. It has changed its color into the color of a tree. Okay class, now that we have learned all these new words, let's use them in some sentences now. I shall show you some sample sentences now. Later on, make your own sentences with these words and show them to your teacher. Ground. Her younger brother hovered in the background watching us. Discern. The man couldn't discern between right and wrong. Hide. The girl dodged behind the tree to hide from the other children. Pepper. He finally stopped and was peppered with bullets from an Apache helicopter. Caress. Cameras caress them from every angle. Novice. I'm a complete novice at skiing. Nonplus. The speaker was completely nonplussed by the question. Children, now that the chapter is finished, let's look at some fun exercises now. You have three minutes to try these questions out. First, how does the poet tell us to identify a bear? Second, what does the poet tell us about a chameleon? Third, how does the poet distinguish the hyena from crocodile? Excellent answer students. Now let's match your answers with the answer sheet. The poet says that if while walking round the courtyard of his house, a person meets a creature who hugs him very very hard, then he can be sure that it is a bear. Answer number two. The poet tells us that a chameleon is found on a tree. It is a creature which can change its color according to the surroundings. It is very difficult to see a chameleon on the tree because it changes its color according to the color of the tree. Answer number 3. The poet tells us how to distinguish a hyena from a crocodile. A hyena is an animal who can laugh. The poet says that if a creature greets a person while smiling merely, then that creature is hyena. If a creature shed tears while swallowing a person, then it is a crocodile. Students, now try to answer these personal questions on your own. Remember students, there can be many correct answers. 
Appearance are deceptive. Cite examples from the poem. How to tell wild animals to corroborate this statement. That's it for today's class. Thank you and hope you all had a fun learning.